Welcome to NTD Evening News. Our top story tonight, the search continues for a masked gunman who killed the CEO of United Healthcare. Police in New York City today released two more photos of a person of interest and new details reveal a possible motive for the crime. We'll hear from Chris Beers. Many residents on the West Coast received a tsunami warning on their phones today. This after a magnitude 7.0 earthquake struck off the coast of California. David Lamb brings us the latest from the Bay Area. Acting Secret Service Director Ronald Rowe testifies for a final time before Congress, before lawmakers release their report on the assassination attempts on President-elect Trump. Luis Martinez has the highlights from today's hearing, which at times escalated into a shouting match. Trump's nominee for Secretary of Defense is on Capitol Hill again today. Pete Haig said meeting with senators who will decide his fate. That says Elon Musk and Vivek Ramaswamy also met with lawmakers about their plans for the Department of Government Efficiency. Amid political turmoil in France, President Emmanuel Macron vows to stay in office and says he'll appoint a new prime minister within days. That's after the resignation of ousted Prime Minister Michel Barnier, whose government fell apart yesterday. David Uvez in Paris. And Amnesty International accuses Israel of genocide against Palestinians in Gaza. How Israel reacts to the claim and what it says about amnesty. Malcolm Hudson reports from London. This is NTD Evening News. Live from our global headquarters in New York City, here's Tiffany Meyer. Good evening and thank you for joining us tonight. The manhunt for the United Healthcare CEO killer continues. More details emerge revealing clues about the lone shooter's intentions. There's new information about his whereabouts before the crime and words that were written on the ammunition used in the shooting. NTD's Chris Spears brings us the story. Authorities searching for the killer of United Healthcare CEO Brian Thompson released photos of a person of interest who's wanted for questioning in connection with the shooting. The man fits the description of the shooter that authorities gave yesterday. The cylindrical couch and black and white checker pattern on the floor behind the man depicted signal he could have been staying at a hostel in Manhattan's Upper West Side. Mateus Toronto, who's currently residing at that hostel, says he saw police there Wednesday evening. About 12 hours after the United Healthcare CEO died, police in the area where he lived were notified about a bomb threat at his home. Authorities in the Minneapolis suburb of Maple Grove said they were investigating a suspected swatting incident, adding it appears to be a hoax. Swatting is when someone falsely alerts authorities to a threat in an unsuspecting person's home. A SWAT team or other law enforcement resources are then dispatched to the home, disrupting the victim and their family. Other details emerging hint at the CEO killer's possible motives. Law enforcement said the words deny, defend and depose were written on the spent shell cases from the ammunition used to kill Thompson. The term depose can mean to testify or to remove someone from office. What's more, these words are similar to the phrase delay, deny, defend, which is the title of a 2010 book about the insurance industry. The subtitle of that book was Why Insurance Companies Don't Pay Claims and What You Can Do About it. Victim Brian Thompson was on his way to United Health Group's 2024 Investor Summit just before 7 a.m. yesterday morning when he was shot and killed. Surveillance video shows Thompson walking alone on 54th Street next to the Hilton Hotel. The shooter then steps onto the sidewalk, stops, raises a handgun with what appears to be a silencer attached to it, and fires towards Thompson's back. The CEO rapidly twists to see the gunman, falls into a wall, and tumbles to the ground. He's then approached by the killer who continues to fire. Authorities say they found three unfired rounds and three shell cases at the scene. The shooter then walks toward the victim and continues to shoot. It appears that the gun malfunctions as he clears the jam and begins to fire again. The shooter then flees on foot northbound into an alleyway between 54th Street and 55th Street. Once at West 55th Street, the shooter continues to walk westbound on Avenue of the Americas where he gets onto an electric E-City bike and rides northbound on the Avenue of the Americas towards Central Park. Where at 6.48 a.m., we have the shooter riding this bike into Central Park at Center Drive.
I hear the three shots. I was I was parking down there in the car. I hear three shots. Yeah, and then when I looked, there's a man down. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and then the guy crossed and then he ran. He's he's a white male, in, all in black, with a backpack. He, he crossed. He crossed this way. I want to be clear. At this time, every indication is that this was a premeditated, pre-planned, targeted attack. The CEO of United Health Group, Andrew Witte, released a statement addressed to employees. He expressed his condolences to Thompson's family in an emotional video. Minnesota governor and former vice presidential candidate Tim Walls called the shooting a tragedy and said he knew the CEO personally. United Healthcare is based in Minnesota. New York Governor Kathy Hochul called it tragic. Chris Beers, NTD News. A tsunami warning for the West Coast was issued and then canceled today. Authorities advise people to stay away from the coast of Northern California and Oregon after an earthquake. Let's check in with NTD's David Lamb. I received the tsunami warning this morning here in California, and the warning was first issued after a 7.0 magnitude earthquake struck off the coast of Northern California in Humboldt County. This was around 1044 local time. Now, people felt shaking throughout the Bay Area, and people even posted videos of their swimming pools shaking from the earthquake. Now, around noon Pacific time, that was when the Tsunami Warning Center canceled the tsunami warning. Yep, so earthquake waves, the shaking, um, the waves that give us shaking from earthquakes, those travel much faster than tsunami waves. So tsunami waves in the ocean, you know, in the open ocean tends to travel about as fast as a, as a jet plane flies, whereas earthquake waves travel much faster. Um, and that means that it's, it's uh, you know, it's easier for us to, to give tsunami warnings because there's a little bit of a, of a time delay there. Many coastal cities and counties told people to evacuate and head for a higher ground to avoid a potential tsunami. Uh, the San Francisco Zoo even evacuated and closed down its zoo, and a, a local San Francisco transit center, BART, even closed down one of its services. As far as we know now, the tsunami center said that no tsunami danger presently exists in Northern California or Oregon. David Lamb, NTD News, California. The House of Representatives held its final hearing before releasing its report on the two attempted assassinations against President-elect Trump. Our Washington correspondent Luis Martinez joins us from the Capitol with the details. U.S. Secret Service Acting Director Ronald Rowe told the bipartisan task force of the House of Representatives investigating the two attempted assassinations against President-elect Donald Trump that he's already implementing changes in four critical areas within the agency. Four areas of deficiencies were identified communications, protective advance processes, command and control processes, and coordination with external entities. Among the changes already implemented by Acting Director Ronald Rowe are the creation of an aviation unit within the Secret Service for drone operations and also a field division unit to better communicate with field offices. So the three goals to start off with, number one, to understand what went wrong on the day of the attempted assassination. We're talking about July 13th in Butler, Pennsylvania. To ensure accountability and to prevent such an agency failure from ever happening again. That is a tough task. Although we received more cooperation from some federal agencies than others, we have been able to firmly establish the facts. We have also critically worked in an overwhelmingly bipartisan manner to ensure that the American people have the answers they deserve. Despite bipartisan consensus in the need for reform within the U.S. Secret Service, the hearing got heated up when Representative Pat Fallon from Texas questioned the acting director's presence in this year's 9-11 commemoration ceremonies in New York City. Agent in charge that no, I wasn't. I was there oh, representing no, no, the Chairman, United I'm States Secret yes Service, no. sir. Mr. Fallon, you know, your time has expired. It did not affect protective Mr. Fallon, your time has expired. Because you want to be visible because you aren't listening for this. I was job. there to pay you're respect for a foreign member. Of this agency. You endangered you President out of line, Biden, Congressman, Vice President, out, out of his life. The bipartisan task force is expected to release its final report on December 13th with recommendations for changes and reform within the U.S. Secret Service. These recommendations will surely impact the budget negotiations to fund government through fiscal year 2025. Reporting from Washington, D.C., Luis Eduardo Martinez, NTD News. 
Trump Secretary of Defense pick Pete Hegseth appears to be getting the support he needs for Senate confirmation. Entities Jack Bradley joins us live now from Palm Beach, Florida, near Trump's Mar-a-Lago residence. Good evening, Jack. How is Hegseth doing drumming up support from the Senate? Good evening, Tiffany. Well, he's getting a lot of support from Senate Republicans. Um, obviously, not everybody's on board. We know Senator Joni Ernst met with Hegseth yesterday and not throwing her full support behind him, neither denying that she would vote for him when the time comes to do so. But despite that, he's not really facing any other major op opposition from within his own party. Now, he's facing uh, allegations of sexual assault as well as excessive drinking. Um, and Senator Tommy Tuberville, uh, all of which he's denied, by the way, but Senator Tommy Tuberville today talking to the press said that Republicans in the Senate shouldn't be questioning Trump's pick, and that should be left up to the Democrats. Take a look. Donald Trump did all the vetting they needed to do on peak headset, and I just can't believe we even have people on our side that are saying, well, I've got to look at this, got to look at that. What they're doing is they're throwing rocks at Donald Trump. They're not throwing them at peak headset. They're throwing them at Donald Trump because they're saying, well, we don't believe you did the right vetting and we don't believe he can do the job. Wait a minute. That's not our job to do that. That's the Democrats. Now, Tuberville sits on the Senate Armed Services Committee, uh, which will oversee the vote of uh, the Secretary of Defense nomination, Hegseth, in January after the next Congress takes uh, place. Now, as far as that uh, committee, who also sits on there throwing his support behind Hegseth is Senator Mike Rounds, who also said that Hegseth meets all of the requirements that he would need to vote for him. Take a look. I really think the president's got the right approach in this particular nominee in terms of his vision for making the Department of Defense more lethal. I think that's what the American people want. They want the Department of Defense focused on lethality, getting those war fighters in condition, and then giving them every single tool they can to make sure that the defense of our country is primary. In that. Senator Rick Scott, another influential member who also sits on the Senate Armed Services Committee, throwing his support behind Hegseth today. Take a look. There's not a lot of Americans that have, that have been willing to put on the uniform and have actually led troops in battle and brought them back safely and knows people uh, that lost their lives, knows people that are injured. When he goes to the Department of Defense, he'll walk in with the mentality that he's going to take care of our war fighters. Now, Senate Republicans will hold in the next Senate a 53 to 47 majority, meaning that if all Democrats vote no for Hegseth, then he can only afford three uh, missing three Republican votes to get forward. And this is a very uncommon thing, Tiffany, for uh, a, a nominee of the president not to be confirmed. The last time it happened was in 1989 under George H.W. Bush, and it happens to be for the his secretary of defense pick as well. Tiffany. All right, Jack, thanks for those updates. Elon Musk and Vivek Ramaswamy, the co-heads of the Department of Government Efficiency, or DOGE, also met with lawmakers on Capitol Hill today. House Speaker Mike Johnson invited the duo to a private meeting with lawmakers to discuss how they plan to slim down the federal government. Here's Johnson speaking to reporters earlier today. There won't be a lot of detail for the press today, and that's by design, because this is a brainstorming session. It is the first, again, as I said, of a long series of, of meetings that will be held as we're laying the groundwork for the new year and the new Congress. And you're going to see a lot of change around here and in Washington and the way things are run. Uh, we need to make government more efficient, and that is what this whole objective is. It's what the Doge um, effort will be about. And you're going to see a bicameral cooperation, and it will be, by the way, bipartisan. Over the last 24, 48 hours, you've seen a number of our Democrat colleagues, both in the Senate and the House, who have said, you know what? Sign me up. I want to be a part of this as well. So we welcome that. It should be a bipartisan effort. Doge is tasked with firing federal workers, cutting government programs, and slashing federal regulations. Musk shared a Senate report today which found that only 6% of federal employees work in person on a full-time basis. Johnson responded to the report saying this is exactly why we need the Department of Government Efficiency. Over 50 Republicans and two Democrats are already launching what they call the Doge Caucus in the House. Despite its name, the Doge is not a government agency and instead an advisory panel. French President Emmanuel Macron announced that he would appoint a new prime minister in the coming days. This follows the resignation of the prime minister earlier today. Entities international correspondent David Vives has the story. 
President Emmanuel Macron stated during a televised address today that he plans to form a streamlined government before January. This announcement follows a no-confidence vote in Parliament yesterday, which resulted today in the resignation of the Prime Minister and the French government. The mandate you have entrusted to me is for five years, and I will exercise it to the full. I will be appointing a Prime Minister in the next few days. I will entrust him with forming a government of general interest, representing all the political forces of an arc of government that can participate in it, or at the very least undertake not to censure it. Macron criticized the alliance of nationalist and leftist coalitions that supported the no-confidence motion. They only think about one thing, the presidential election, to prepare for it, to provoke it, to precipitate it, and to do so with cynicism if necessary, and a certain sense of chaos. The president added that France's new government will vote on the 2025 budget law in January. France's constitution states that no snap elections can be held before September 2025. David Dives, NTD News, Paris. Amnesty International accuses Israel of genocide in Gaza, alleging it deliberately sought to destroy Palestinians. Israel completely rejects this, instead condemning Amnesty for downplaying the intent of Hamas to annihilate Israel. NTD's international correspondent Malcolm Hudson has more from London. London-based human rights group Amnesty International has accused the state of Israel of committing genocide against the Palestinians in Gaza. It's an accusation Israel strongly rejects, instead reiterating how it has a right to defend itself following Hamas's October 7th terrorist attack. Presenting Amnesty's report to journalists in The Hague, Secretary General Agnes Kalamard said the conclusion had not been taken lightly, politically or preferentially. We found the repeated use of dehumanizing language. We found statements calling for genocidal act and other crimes under international law. Amnesty alleges Israel has sought to deliberately destroy Palestinians by mounting deadly attacks, demolishing vital infrastructure and preventing the delivery of food, medicine and other aid. The 1948 Genocide Convention, enacted in the wake of the mass murder of Jews in the Holocaust, defines genocide as acts committed with intent to destroy, in part or in whole, a national, ethnical, racial or religious group. Amnesty says it believes the legal threshold for the crime has been met. Israel has repeatedly rejected any accusation of genocide. It says it has respected international law and has a right to defend itself after Hamas killed 1,200 Israelis and took 250 hostages. Government spokesperson David Mercer said Amnesty has a long record of framing Israel as an illegitimate nation. For Amnesty, Israel was born guilty in 1948 and have been guilty ever since. They distort reality and downplay the clear intent of Hamas to annihilate Israel. Just listen to what Hamas and Iran say. He also said Amnesty manipulated international law to falsely portray self-defense as genocide. Gaza has a population of around 2.3 million. Gaza's Hamas-run health ministry says 44,500 Palestinians have been killed by Israel over the course of the war a figure that has not been independently verified, nor does it make the distinction between Hamas fighters and regular civilians. Israel says it has killed over 17,000 terrorists and blames Hamas for civilian deaths because Hamas builds military infrastructure in residential areas such as schools, homes and hospitals. Israel's official stance has always been that this war is against Hamas, not the people of Gaza. Amnesty urged the International Criminal Court prosecutor to investigate the alleged genocide. The Office of the Prosecutor said in a statement that it is continuing investigations into alleged crimes committed in the Palestinian territories and is unable to provide further comments. Malcolm Hudson, NTD News London. Coming up, the Bipartisan Committee on the Chinese Communist Party says the U.S. needs to ramp up domestic production to prevent a war with China. They say if changes don't happen soon, it could entice aggressive action from the communist nation. Jason Blair reports from D.C. And California Governor Gavin Newsom announced an upcoming project at San Diego's newest port of entry. The move aims to reshape the national debate on the U.S.-Mexico border. Christina Corona brings us more from Los Angeles when we return.
Welcome back. I'm Tiffany Meyer. How to deter a possible future war with China. The House Committee on the Chinese Communist Party says it's crucial to immediately start strengthening America's defense industrial base. This includes increasing domestic production of important military equipment and stopping reliance on China. NTD correspondent Jason Blair reports. The bipartisan House Committee on the Chinese Communist Party says the U.S. needs to make immediate changes in order to prevent a future hot war with China. Congressman Raja Krishnamurthy says that recent polling shows a majority of voters think there's a 50-50 chance of a war with China within the next 10 years. From the same study, we see that almost 80 percent of voters believe we should do everything we can in our power to prevent war with China. The committee says it's imperative that America strengthen its defense industrial base and workforce. That our defense industrial base lacks the capacity to deter and win a fight with the PRC. Congressman Krishnamurthy says that the U.S. relies on China for many essential components and materials for military use. He says, for example, three minerals gallium, antimony, and germanium, which are used in many weapon systems. Just two days ago, the CCP, maybe noticing this very chart, announced it was banning exports to the U.S. of, you guessed it, gallium, antimony, and germanium. G-A-G, -G, it makes me gag. The committee also brought in experts to make suggestions. What is now required is no less than a complete restructuring of the processes, incentives, and culture behind our defense requirements, acquisition, contracting, budgeting, and technology control systems. If such a conflict were to occur, we may be ready for day one, but we are utterly unprepared for day 30, let alone day 300. America and our allies need to rebuild the arsenal of democracy, and that is achievable, but only if we adopt a fundamentally new approach to how we define, design, and produce military power. The committee says in the past, hostile leaders made aggressive moves when America was close to similar situations related to defense production. Reporting on Capitol Hill, Jason Blair, NTD News. Tensions between Washington and Beijing over Taiwan are escalating. Taiwan said today its president, William Lai, spoke with House Speaker Mike Johnson over the phone. China soon imposed sanctions on over a dozen U.S. military firms and multiple company executives starting today. Beijing warned the U.S. to not cross its first red line, referring to relations with Taiwan. Taiwan's presidential office said Lai called Johnson during his Pacific trip but did not give it details. After Taiwan's statement, the Chinese foreign ministry announced sanctions on 13 U.S. defense firms plus six company executives. The ministry said that's in response to the recent $385 million arms sale Washington approved to Taiwan. Then the ministry held a press conference warning the U.S. not to cross the, quote, first red line, a reference to Taiwan's independence. Washington does not recognize Taiwan as an independent country, but it is bound by law to provide the island with weapons to defend itself. Beijing's ruling body, the Chinese Communist Party, has never ruled Taiwan, but claims the island as part of China, a stance Taiwan's government rejects. California Governor Gavin Newsom today visited the U.S.-Mexico border. He addressed key initiatives aimed at strengthening the state's economy and border security. NTD's Christina Corona tells us more. California Governor Gavin Newsom highlighted the progress on the Otay East Port of Entry project Thursday afternoon, focusing on economic and workforce development strategies in California near the U.S.-Mexico border. Newsom discussed California's regional economic development approach, which tailors solutions to the specific needs of areas like San Diego and Imperial County along the southern border. We're going to be moving forward um, in the next few weeks. We've identified a contractor. We're going to be moving forward uh, with building the roads uh, right behind us uh, to get down uh, to this section of the border. Uh, and we are in the final phases, uh, working very collaboratively with the White House and uh, Mayorkas and the team, Homeland Security, to finally formalize our design contract. 
The plan includes substantial funding for local projects and aims to strengthen cross-border partnerships with Mexico to boost regional economies. Newsom announced that a formal partnership agreement will be in place by the end of the month, allowing the project to move forward in January with plans to complete it by December 2027. It's been a stubborn project uh, for one reason and one reason alone, full disclosure, operational questions of how we manage this new port of entry and the funding that comes from actively managing it. And that's the process that is unfolding in real time as it relates to the details uh, of this final agreement that we're working with the White House. Newsom also highlighted the critical role of the National Guard in combating narcotics trafficking along the California-Mexico border. Uh, those counter-narcotics efforts led by the National Guard uh, just in 2023, uh, they were successful in seizing 62,000 pounds statewide of fentanyl. Newsom announced plans to expand the National Guard's operations to not only address the flow of illicit drugs into California, but also to focus on combating the trafficking of illegal assets into Mexico. Looking at the flow going south, particularly as it relates to illicit money and as it relates uh, to weapons. A big part of what happens on the other side of the border as it relates to violence is happening with American-made weapons that come south to Mexico from America. And we need to do a better job to attach a focus, responsibility, and energy in that space. This announcement comes as President-elect Trump's victory in November was driven in part by voter concerns over illegal immigration and his promise of mass deportations. Christina Corona, NTD News. Up next, the U.S. Supreme Court is weighing a landmark case about gender transition procedures for minors. A biologist joins us to explore the case and the arguments presented by the two sides after the break. Welcome back. If you're just joining us now, here are some today's top headlines. The gunman is still at large and a manhunt continues after United Healthcare CEO Brian Thompson was shot and killed in an ambush in New York City. The NYPD released photos of the suspect and asked for the public's help in identifying him. A magnitude 7 earthquake shook Northern California, prompting a brief tsunami warning for people along the West Coast. The shock was felt as far south as San Francisco, but there were no reports of major damage or injury. French President Emmanuel Macron announced he will name a new prime minister within days after Parliament ousted the government in a no-confidence vote. Macron also vowed to stay in office until the end of his term in 2027. President-elect Trump's defense pick Pete Hegseth said he has no plan to withdraw after meeting with congressional lawmakers. Meanwhile, Elon Musk and Vivek Ramaswamy also met with lawmakers on Capitol Hill to discuss the work of the Department of Government Efficiency. The Supreme Court began hearing oral arguments in a landmark case that challenges Tennessee's ban on transgender procedures for minors. This could potentially impact the availability of such procedures nationwide. Joining us to discuss is Colin Wright, biologist as well as CEO and editor-in-chief of Reality's Last Stand. Colin, thank you so much for joining us. Good to see you, go Good to see you again. Now, before we dive into the nitty-gritty of what's being argued here, if the Supreme Court supports the Tennessee law, given that 24 states have similar laws, how big of an impact will a ruling like this have across the nation? Um, it'll be huge. It'll allow the states to, you know, make the rules for themselves and how they want to treat uh, these rules surrounding gender affirming care, which is really just giving, you know, minors, uh, puberty blockers, cross, cross sex hormones, or certain surgeries that really don't have a solid evidence base for it. So I think right now about 26 states uh, have these bans in place. And so really, if this law were kicked down, if this were to get defeated at the Supreme Court, it would create an absolute mess for the rest of the states that have already have these bans in there because it would essentially say that now the states have to move to an intermediate level of scrutiny, which means that they will have to like have courts decide on all the nitty gritty evidence, which will open it up to, you know, uh, countless repeals and, and endless um, just relitigating the same thing over and over again. So I think it is pretty important that this case be upheld. 
And given that impact that you just laid out, the Tennessee law at the heart of this case prohibits healthcare workers in the state from prescribing puberty blockers and hormones to minors for gender transition procedures, but it does not impact other cases like congenital defects or early puberty. Now, the Biden administration and three families sued the law, saying that the government shouldn't have a say and that the law violates the 14th Amendment of the Constitution. Now, as a biologist, how are you looking at this case? You know, I try to look at it uh, at the premise of it because we spend a lot of time talking about the evidence for gender affirming care. Does this produce better outcomes, better mental health outcomes, reduce suicide and suicidality, that type of thing? Um, but while it's good to have evidence of whether these things work, which currently all the systematic reviews that have been done, such as in the CAST review, have shown that there is no good evidence to support the use of any of these interventions. Um, I try to look at the, the foundational premise, which is this notion that we all have this innate gender identity, that this can be incongruent with our bodies, that sex is a spectrum, and therefore we should be able to modify our secondary sex characteristics to put them in line with our, our gender identity or our brain sex. You know, it really matters if the, the fundamental premise for these procedures uh, is rooted in biological reality, and right now it, it is not. Now, in terms of the oral arguments yesterday, Justices Kagan, Sotomayor, and Jackson seem persuaded by the argument that the law is unconstitutional. Sotomayor saying these transgender kids will, quote, suffer incredibly without these medical interventions. Now, Justices Kavanaugh and Alito, on the other hand, highlighted that European nations where these kinds of procedures started are now reversing course. In your view, how convincing were the oral arguments yesterday? The oral arguments, at least by the ACLU lawyers who are trying to defeat this law, I thought they were pretty bad. And again, they try to equivocate between very different things. They're trying to say that if you were to give a, a, a boy or something testosterone because he had a condition called precocious puberty, or say they had a testosterone deficiency, uh, and you give them testosterone that helps their body function and achieve its, its natural uh, healthy function, then we're therefore compelled to also give testosterone to young girls to affirm their gender identity, which actually uh, introduces medical complications such as uh, atrophy of the uterus. Um, it's going to have them grow facial hair, deepening voices. It's going to lead to lifelong sterility if they had been puberty blocked beforehand. So the main point here is that these are completely different applications of it. You can't say just because we give boys testosterone in some contexts, therefore we need to give females testosterone for an entirely different con context that, again, can't be stressed enough, has no good evidence that it actually benefits these people. Now, as you mentioned earlier, the cast review, it also had a huge impact in Europe. Do you see that playing a role in these arguments here? Yes, the cast review was brought up many times throughout. Um, there was a particularly interesting exchange um, between, I think it was Alito and the ACLU lawyer Chase Strangio where Strangio actually admitted that you know, when pressed against this, given the evidence in the cast review about suicide, that the common claim among uh, gender activists that uh, this gender affirming care is life saving and that it decreases suicide and where parents are pressured to transition their kids because otherwise their kid is likely to commit suicide. He admitted on the stand that there is actually no good evidence for this and that he was conflating suicide rates uh, which are actual completed suicides with suicidality, which are just sort of the thoughts or intent to commit suicide. But we know from the cast review, which thankfully was quoted in, in these, uh, these oral arguments, that there's actually no good evidence to suggest that increased actual suicides takes place or that there's even increased suicidality when you control for other mental health issues. Well, Colin Wright, a lot to look forward here in this argument and this case. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Coming up, President Biden and Vice President Harris attending their final White House Christmas tree lighting before leaving office. It comes as Harris makes a surprise appearance at a gathering of local lawmakers. Iris Tao has more. Shinyan Performing Arts is returning to the stage just before Christmas with an all-new production for 2025. Hear what dignitaries from around the world have to say about the show. And tonight in the NFL, Detroit hosts Green Bay in a pivotal division battle. Dave Martin joins us to preview the action when we come back.
Welcome back. I'm Tiffany Meyer. World-renowned Shenyun Performing Arts is returning to the stage just before Christmas with an all-new production for 2025. Over the past 19 years, the company has garnered worldwide acclaim, drawing celebrities, dignitaries, and audiences eager to experience its unique blend of artistry and spiritual insight. Starting this month, Shen Yun's 2025 tour will take to the stage across Asia, Europe, and the Americas. With its top-notch artistry portraying the beauty of a divinely inspired culture, the world-class performing arts company has mesmerized audiences everywhere it goes. Wow, Shen Yun is a perfect blend of music, dance, and audiovisual effects, a fusion of tradition and modern technology. It's truly amazing how the performers can effortlessly switch from real life to a virtual world on the backdrop. It's very well done. It was an extraordinary performance, and the artistic quality was just as remarkable. Truly a top-tier show. The audience, in turn, expressed their heartfelt admiration for Shen Yun with enthusiastic and sustained applause. I just enjoyed the pageantry, the color, the movement. Um, it was exciting. It was actually, what I really enjoyed most about it is the storytelling without words and being able to, to really identify the story as it makes its way through. Through breathtaking dance and music, Shen Yun's artists bring to life stories of ancient wisdom and timeless virtues. Each performance is a celebration of China's rich cultural heritage before communist rule. This was a truly moving performance, not only highlighting spiritual identity and tradition, but also embodying the spirit of freedom. These are values we deeply believe in, and to see them converge in such a touching performance is especially gratifying. Of course, also gives a unique chance to see and, and experience Chinese culture in, in all its uh, variety and, and, and fantastic ways. The performance gives the impression that these practitioners want to contribute to the society they live in, following the principles of compassion, tolerance and truthfulness, making the world a better place. The show's stunning elegance and uplifting energy touch the soul of every viewer. That's what I love about it. And you can see it in the colors, you can see it in, the, in how they work together, you can see in their big smiles, you can see how the whole community works very tight together. It's like a very strong, tight team. Thank you for the beautiful performance and that belief. Just, you've, they've done a wonderful job. I look at them, I'm just in awe. I'm amazed at how well they they're, they're perform. They look like they're, they really look like they're enjoying themselves. I recommend everyone to see Shen Yun and experience a rare, unique cultural and artistic event. In fact, Shen Yun also touches the heart and offers profound inspiration. Shen Yun will be kicking off its 2025 global tour in Atlanta, Georgia on December 23rd. For more information and to secure your tickets, visit shenyun.com. And now for your sports news, we're joined by NTD's Dave Martin. Dave, a lot going on today, but let's start in college football. As a recent University of Texas report into October's bottle-throwing incident against Georgia resulted in no one being caught, what prompted this investigation? Was it the NCAA? Yeah, it was actually their conference, the SEC. Now, this is a very pivotal game between two top five teams. And what happened was Texas was trailing like 23-7, to 7, I think, in the third quarter when a pass interference call on them wiped out a much-needed interception. Now, replay showed it was a bad call. No, Texas coach Steve Sarkeesian saw it. He was furious. So were the fans. You started throwing bottles on the field. So Sarkeesian then walks over to the bottles where, well, you know, where they're coming from, seem to be around the student section, pleads with them to stop. They do, but the game is delayed a few minutes for them to clear the debris. Meanwhile, the referees gathered during the delay and end up reversing the call. Now, that infuriated Georgia coach Kirby Smart but it was the right call. Georgia ended up winning anyway. Afterwards, though, the SEC fined the school $250,000 and ordered them to find those responsible for throwing all those bottles on the field. Now, nearly three weeks later, this is November 7, Texas Athletic Director tells the SEC they haven't been able to identify any of the bottle throwers. This report all just came to light this week. Now, I'd love to hear what the SEC's response was. It's Texas saying, you know, we found no one. We, we have not heard yet from the SEC. We do have a rematch of the game this weekend, Texas versus Georgia for the SEC title. Hopefully, no bottles thrown at that game. 
Well, elsewhere in the game, Big 12 Commissioner Brett Yormark was critical of the playoff committee's ranking, saying, quote, in no way should a group of five champion be ranked above our champion. You think he has a point? You know, at the beginning of the season, I would have said yes, absolutely. You know, that a one, a one loss group of five team ranked ahead of a two loss power four team that's leading their conference, that seemed to be very hard to believe. But right now, Boise State, a group of five team, is ranked ahead of every Big 12 team. They're number 10. The closest Big 12 teams, Arizona State at 15, Iowa State right behind them at 16. But looking how this played out, it's really hard to argue with the committee. Boise State's one loss is at number one ranked Oregon and was by a field goal. Meanwhile, both Arizona State and Boise State have one win apiece over ranked teams ranked in the top 25. Now, obviously, if Boise State loses in the conference championship game this Saturday, the winner of the Big 12 is surely going to be ranked ahead of them. And it's very important because who gets these top four seeds gets a bye in the first round. Now, otherwise, either Arizona State is going to, have to blow out Iowa State or vice versa in the Big 12 title game of having any chance of passing Boise State. Shifting gears to baseball, the A's have signed free agent pitcher Luis Severino to a three-year deal that's worth more than $60 million. Now, what are expectations for this team as they move to Sacramento next season? Yeah, I think that's a question everyone's asking. Severino's a good pitcher. He's on a team, and now he's on a team that really exceeded expectations last year, despite finishing you know next to last in the AL West. And you're right, they're playing the next three seasons in a minor league ballpark, actually, in Sacramento as they wait their Las Vegas stadium. I'm sure that's angered, obviously, those Oakland fans. Now, some wondered if that would deter players from signing there. I mean, this deal looks like it hasn't done that, though. I like this deal for the A's. Severino went healthy. He's a very good pitcher. I don't think it moves them into playoff contention for next season. But of course, I didn't think Kansas City would make the playoffs this year, and I was wrong about that. So uh, we'll have to see how the season goes, though. But Severino signing, I think, looks good for them. Well, tonight in the NFL, it's the Green Bay Packers at the Detroit Lions on Thursday night football. Now, both teams here are in the running for the top seed in the NFC. How pivotal is this game? Yeah, I think it's pivotal for both teams. Detroit right now is 11-1. They're tied with the best record in the NFL with Kansas City, but their division is loaded. I mean, Minnesota's right behind them at 10-2, Green Bay, who they play tonight, 9-3. So in the division, three, you have teams with three of the four best records in the NFC, but only one can win the division in the top four seeds in the conference only go to division winners. So right now, Green Bay, third best record in the NFC, but they're only in line for a six seed. Do they have to play on the road in the first round? Uh, you know, so unless they can catch Detroit here, tonight is going to be a great opportunity for them. Now, the Lions already won the first the first matchup of the season between these two like a month ago. So if the Packers are going to have any chance of catching them, they have to win tonight's game. And they're on a roll. They won seven of the last eight. Detroit, though, even harder. They won 10 in a row. They are favored, favored by a field goal. And tonight's game starts at 8.15 Eastern time. It's on Amazon Prime. Well, Davis, always thanks for joining us. Well, thank you. President Biden and Vice President Harris tonight hosting the final national Christmas tree lighting in their four-year administration. It also marks a rare appearance of Harris after she conceded the election to Trump four weeks ago. And today's White House correspondent Iris Tao has more. Five, four, three, two, one. With less than two months left in their administration, President Biden and Vice President Harris attending their final White House Christmas tree lighting at the Ellipse. Many of us will sing, Oh Holy Night. The phrase in that song is, His law is love, His gospel is peace. May I wish for you and for the nation, now and always, as we continue to seek the light of liberty and love, kindness and compassion, dignity and decency, Merry Christmas, America. Merry Christmas to all of you. May God bless you all. Thursday also marks a rare appearance of Harris after Harris conceded the election to Trump on November 6th. <laughs> While Harris has not spoken in public much beyond her concession speech, she made a surprise appearance on Thursday at a gathering of local black lawmakers in Washington, telling them to stay committed to fighting for constituents. All of these Meanwhile, in the final weeks of the Biden administration, President Biden could still get to a few priorities. The White House has said Biden is expected to issue more pardons and clemencies before leaving office. 
and Biden has been doubling down on sending more aid to Ukraine, most recently sending Ukraine more than $700 million in landmines and counter drone systems. And Biden continues to get briefings about domestic and international developments. He says he got briefed on a martial law situation in South Korea while in Angola. And the White House on Thursday said the president had been briefed on a 7.0 magnitude earthquake off the coast of Northern California. The White House asked the administration stands by ready to provide further support as needed, though at this time there are no requests for federal help. Reporting by Iris Tao, NTD News. And that's all for today's news. For round-the-clock coverage, visit us at ntd.com or download our NTD app. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Tiffany Meyer. Good night.